There is still paint on the floor of Diane's mother's garage from when we made floats in our senior year of high school for homecoming. By that time, I had already known Diane for six years. I met her when I was 11. And we went all through school together and then just kind of kept up through Christmas cards and then social media afterwards. And then when my kids started going to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, Diane didn't live too far away. And so three or four of us got together and we started having a breakfast club. And when I was down, I'd get together with Diane and a couple of other friends and we would just reconnect. Um, I talked to her not too long ago, and then I went on a fishing trip to Montana. And when I came back from Montana, one of my other friends had posted on Facebook, Diane, I already miss you. And I was like, what? Turns out in the space of time that I was in Montana, Diane was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer and died within five days. And as I thought about this person that I have known most of my entire life and the fact that like that she was dead, I remembered how much I hate cancer. I remembered how much I hate wasting diseases. I remembered how much I hate getting old and falling apart. I remember how much I hate death, how much I hate war, how much I hate resource hoarding and selfish behavior and so many other things that are at core an evidence that things are broken, that just remind me that there is evil loose in the world. Yeah, people are often willing participants, but there's something behind the people that is driving them. And acknowledging that there is evil is why we are taking some time before the election to talk about things. So we're in the second week of our sermon series, and it's titled Fighting the Right Battle. Because we want to make sure that we are putting our resources and our energy and our prayer in the right direction. And last week we talked about what is the battle and how do we prepare. And this week we're going to talk about who is the enemy. And we've been in Ephesians chapter 6. And just a quick overview of Ephesians. Ephesians talks about a lot of things, but two primary emphases in the book of Ephesians are the, identity, are the idea of identity, who we are in Christ, and power. God's power and the power of evil around us. And both of those will come up in the passage today. Um, in, there's six chapters in the book. Verses 1 through 3 are primarily about what God has done for us in Christ, about how our lives have been changed. Chapter 4 and 5 are how should we live in response to that because of everything Jesus has done for you. How do you need to live your life? And then in the concluding chapter, chapter 6, is where Paul reminds us of the reality of evil and how that affects things. And last week, the verse that we read was 610, which says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So today we're going to be in Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12, where Paul writes, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So a couple notes. First of all, put on the full armor of God. Note that Paul doesn't say just part of it. Pick one that you like best. He wants you to put on all of it. And I think that speaks to a call to full commitment. And uh, I think that, you know, back then in the days of Ephesians, and if we look at where we're living now, um, post-COVID and other things, I think the time of dabbling with Jesus is over. I think it's time to commit. The fish or cut bait. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that passage, because next week Angela is going to uh, unpack that for all of us. But the reason that Paul starts with that is so that we will be equipped, so that we can take a stand in the struggle or the battle against evil. So what is it exactly that we're struggling with? Who is the enemy? Well, contrary to what your first thought might be, or what people toss out there, the enemy is not people. People are not the enemy. Oh, people are irritating sometimes. People can be exasperating sometimes. And, and then there's people outside of the church. But, <laughs> but they aren't the enemy. The enemy stands behind all the hateful, sinful things that we do. But the people aren't the enemy. I mean, we need to remember 
that Jesus died and was raised again by the power of God on the three days to redeem people. People who are sinful, people who are wrong, even people who have a different political view than we have. I mean, that's the whole point of the gospel, right? Is while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So for us as followers of Jesus, people aren't the enemy. People are to be loved in Jesus' name. So, but what exactly is love? Because I wanted to find that because English is not helpful at this point. You know, when we think of love, we think about, you know, the, the first days of romance, you know, and all the glory of that and just the warm glow over everything. That's just, that's just a part of it. I think for me that love is the day in and day out actively wishing good for someone else. That's what love looks like on a regular basis, where we're actively wishing good for somebody else. We were driving back from California a couple years ago, uh, later at night in Oregon, and there was a point where there was a car in the fast lane, and it was going, as I remember it, about 22 miles an hour. And I came up, I came up behind it, and um, I was going the speed limit-ish, and uh, so um, I got behind it, and, and the person wouldn't move out of the way. So eventually they packed, because you know how people get next to each other and they keep going. Um, but eventually the person in the slower lane went even slower, like 18. And so I cut around on the right. And as I came next to this person, they got so mad because they did not want to be passed. And so they sped up. So I sped up, and they sped up. I slowed down, and they slowed down. This went on for like 20 miles until I was like, this is crazy. I mean, my first concern was, I, I don't want to be involved in this. I don't want this to be a road rage in, uh, incident. This is just dumb. So I was concerned about safety. But when I finally pulled off the road, this was really what was going through my head. And I want to fully acknowledge that I only tell the stories where I look good. But I, I, I want to fully acknowledge that... Uh, when we pulled off the road, I, I looked at them, and it, it, was, it was actually a younger person, and I thought, I just feel bad for them. I mean, what is going on in their lives that they get so aggressive about somebody just trying to go faster than them? I thought, I don't hate them. I don't want them to hurt me, but what I really wish for them is healing, is, you know, hope or health. It's that type of thing. That's loving other people, where you just care about them. So people are not the enemy. Write this down. Kamala Harris is not the enemy. Donald Trump is not the enemy. Whoever the governor is, is not the enemy. Marjorie Taylor Greene is not the enemy. Ilhan Omar is not the enemy. Whatever people group you don't like or don't agree with or don't approve of are not the enemy. Evil which manifests itself in so many ways that brings about pain and destruction. Evil that still lives in our hearts and needs to be rooted out every day, otherwise it will regain or retain control. Evil is the enemy. And we need to keep that in mind. One of my favorite lines in this passage is that it talks about the devil has schemes. I just think that's so poetic. You know, sometimes we think that evil is just disorganized. It's not. Evil is organized. Evil has a plan and a purpose. Evil has an aim. And what's the plan and the purpose of evil? Well, it's not so much around social issues or political emphases, at least not in this passage. So we've already got two interesting points on the table. People aren't the enemy, and politics isn't the issue. So if that's not the issue... What is the issue? What are the schemes of the devil that as followers of Jesus we are called to resist? It kind of boils down to two things. We talked a little bit about them last week. It's about who we are in Christ, our identity, and the witness of the church. Because one of the schemes of the devil, of the evil powers, is tempting the church to compromise its holiness. That's technical language, so hold on to that for just a second and tempting Jesus' followers to adopt thinking and behavior that doesn't look or sound like Jesus. Those are what the temptations are. That's what we're fighting against. The powers who want to strip you of your identity in Christ so that people who know Jesus will walk away from him and that the ruin of the witness of the church um, will happen so that no one who doesn't yet know Jesus ever will. 
That's what evil is seeking to do. So I use compromising holiness on purpose because it's a great biblical term. But like love, it needs a little bit of definition. So what does holy mean? Generally, in our culture, it does not have a, a positive connotation. Um, it generally it comes out in phrases like holier than thou, which is not a positive thing. But biblically, holiness is always a positive thing. And what it basically means is to be set apart. So we are, when, and we talked about this last week, when Paul talks about being in Christ, it's like a geographical location. We've been moved to a different geographical location where we are in Christ, and now we are set apart. We are holy. And so the church is set apart by God to live life in what Tim Gombus called radically different and wonderfully redemptive ways. The church is called to be different, and the church is called to be wonderfully redemptive. Now, there's, an, there's so many examples in the Bible of where holiness of God's people is compromised. So, the, you know, I'm reading the Bible through a year, through in a year, so the Old Testament is just right here for me. Um, and Israel is called to be an example to the nations. They're called to be holy to God, set apart for him, so that through their witness, everybody might see who God is. And right away, Israel compromises their holiness. They compromise their set-apartedness. And rather than being a light to the nations, they want to be like the nations. And they do exactly like that. One of the most poignant points in the Bible is when Israel rejects God as king and says, we want to be like everybody else. We want to have our own king. And God's like, that's a mistake, but if you want to do that, okay. So they get a king instead of having God as a king. And they don't seem to care about what's really on God's heart, like justice and peace. Again, over and over and over in the Old Testament. And they pretty much abandon doing good to the poor or the orphan or the widow. And again, in Tim Gombas's book, I, I loved what he noted as he goes through this list of how Israel gives up its holiness. They failed to trust that if they truly enjoyed God's good world by taking a day off to rest and enjoy creation, God would supply their needs. In other words, they were afraid if they followed God, it, was, it would cost money. If they, didn't, if they didn't work on the Sabbath, they were leaving money on the table. And so they kept working. So the powers tempted Israel to follow other gods. And the powers tempt us to do that. And this is, this is two points that I made last week. The concern that Paul has isn't that the church is, isn't changing the society to look like the church. His concern was that the church would change to look like the society. And that's what we're supposed to stand against, against the powers of evil and not become like the culture. Now, there's also a positive um, a positive example of this, and it comes out of the book of Daniel. Um, some of you are like, we can't wait till he gets to the New Testament in his Bible reading. But others of you are like, I've never known so much about the Old Testament. But um, So in the book of Daniel, Daniel and a bunch of other people from Israel are taken captive, and they go to Babylon. And Daniel, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are all put in high places of power in the king's court. But they are put under tremendous pressure to conform, to eat the food that the Babylonians eat, to worship the Babylonians, God, to look like the Babylonians, to dress like the Babylonians. Incredible pressure. And they refuse over and over and over again to give up their identity as the people of God and become Babylonians. They might live in Babylon, but their allegiance isn't to Babylon. Their allegiance is to God. And they were never compromised by the system. There's this line in Daniel chapter 9, which is really easy to skip over, but it is so momentous if you think about it for a second. Daniel chapter 9 says, An angel of the Lord visited Daniel about the time of the evening sacrifice. Folks, at this point in time, scholars think that Daniel might have been in Babylon for almost 70 years. The temple had long been destroyed. There had not been an evening sacrifice in decades. And yet, he still felt the rhythm and the pattern of God. And every day he knew when the evening sacrifice was. And he ordered his life around the patterns of God. His deepest reality was not who Babylon told him he was. His deepest reality was who God told him he was. 
And we're called to maintain our identity in Christ and to maintain the witness of the church. So Paul goes on to talk about how, as Jesus followers, we're called on to stand against evil. So evil has a strategy. God has a strategy. What's the strategy? How are we supposed to stand against evil? Well, it becomes a little complicated. So hang with me here. There is this, this concept throughout the scriptures, particularly in the Old Testament. Who saw that coming, right? Particularly in the Old Testament, where God shows up as the divine warrior. He comes and he fights on behalf of his people. One of the greatest examples of this is in the Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 15, it captures this language. Then Moses and the Israelites sang the song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he's highly exalted. Both horse and driver he's hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He's become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his armor he is hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. And that's pretty typical God as divine warrior language from the Old Testament. The picture of God working on behalf of his people to defeat the enemy. And then we have a picture from the New Testament, the opposite end of the book. In the book of Revelation, we have a picture of Jesus as the divine warrior. Revelation 19. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations." He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So you have this picture of Jesus as the divine warrior. So as the divine warrior, God is rescuing his people by defeating their enemy. So then let's extend that metaphor to us. So our strategy as the church is to confront the power of evil and take on the divine warrior mantle. Yes. So get me what my white horse and my sword. No. See, in Revelation, Jesus comes back to finish what he got started. Jesus is coming back to complete what he's already done. Evil is not defeated at the Battle of Armageddon. Evil is not defeated at any other battle because evil has already been defeated where? When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The powers defeated on the cross and by the resurrection. That's when the power is defeated. Ergo, it is not our task to defeat the powers because God has already defeated them. The powers are ultimately defeated on the cross in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The church, you and me as Jesus followers, are called to live into the victory that Jesus has already won. It's not about what we have done or what we do or who we fight. It's about what Jesus has already done. And when we begin to believe that the battle belongs to us and not to the Lord, we begin to do things that are out of character with the gospel. And this is to some extent where we find ourselves today. Our job is to put on the full armor of God and to stand firm, to represent Jesus, to not compromise, to resist the corrupting power of the culture, and to live out the new life we have found in Christ. The church is to do what God has done as the divine warrior. We're supposed to rescue God's people because we are God's presence in the world. We are the Jesus that people see. And our job is to take the good news of the gospel and to work it into people's lives in hope of redeeming them. 
We're called as the followers of Jesus to step into that divine warrior model. But our model for a divine warrior is Jesus. And the cross demonstrates most fully what God's battle plan is. And the scriptures are clear about how we fight the battle. Revelations. They had victory over him by the blood the lamb spilled for them. They had victory over him by speaking the truth about Jesus to others. They were willing to risk their lives even if it led to death. Older translations said they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimonies. That's how we fight. We're supposed to resist the force of evil, not by using the tools of evil or the strategies of the society, but by living counterculturally in response to the cross. We bring about change in the world in people's lives by reflecting the love and the grace and, yes, truth of Jesus. And we do that, this is this great phrase which I'm going to toss out to you today. We do that by cruciform living. We live in light of the cross. We live with the example of Christ crucified. We live lives that are compelled by the cross to do certain things. We live differently. And I love what Andy Crouch said. Being a radical is actually pretty easy. Just give away 10% of your money and watch less TV, and that will make you a witness to the people around you. And that's so true. I mean, we see over and over again the power of being an influencer. I mean, I am so tired of people who do nothing except put their opinions out on social media, all of a sudden having $100 million of net worth. I'm like, how does that happen? But there is tremendous power in influencing people. And that's why I love the quote by Andy, Andy Crouch. You don't have to be all that extraordinary. Watch less TV. You know, I mean, when, when, when people are talking about what they do with their money, tell them what you do with your money. You know, we, our, my church support, you know, got 200 coats for kids. We gave three of those. And people will be like, why would you give your money away? Oh, why would I not? I mean, it, it's not that hard. We're supposed to deal with people redemptively. And so what I'm learning during this incredibly difficult time is that I can stand against someone without hating anyone. I'm learning to disagree with people without getting emotionally entangled. Because what I'm realizing is like that driver on that Oregon highway, the thing that people really need is not to be convinced to come over to my political view. They need to get to Jesus. Because Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the one who changes people. Let the Supreme Court do what the Supreme Court is going to do. That's not where my faith lies. My faith lies with Jesus. And one of the things that I'm trying to live out is so that the only stumbling block for people is the cross, not my politics. So you think, well, we can't just love everyone. Yeah, yeah, we can. Well, we can't just approve of everything. No, and we don't. But just remember that the glory of the gospel is that God's love was extended to you and to me while your act was not together while we were still sinners. And the thing that I want to do is to not stand in the way of people coming to Jesus. Um, N.T. Wright, who I probably have not quoted in at least three weeks, um, was talking about the implications of cruciform living. And he said this, and I want to pick up on, on one phrase. Jesus was redefining the nature of the kingdom with regard to radical self-giving and self-denial. And it looks as though that was never simply an ethical demand, but at its heart, a personal vocation. It comes about being because throughout his public career, Jesus was redefining power itself, and his violent death was the ultimate demonstration in practice of that redefinition. A personal vocation. It was a call of God to live in a specific way. A call of God for us to respond to what God has done for us. A personal vocation. If I can be honest, most of us just want to be left alone. We want to get into the college of our choice. We don't want to be bullied. We don't want to be cut off by jerks on the freeway. We don't have to worry about running out of money in retirement. We want to make sure that we have enough groceries to pay our bills and feed enough. we have money to, pay, to feed our family to pay for groceries. We just want to live our lives and be left alone. But we have a call in our lives. 
I am by the call of God helping to bring the hope of Jesus to the world. I have a personal vocation that calls me out of my desire to just be left alone and do my own thing and to step into the stream of what Jesus is doing. So what does this have to do with the election? Well, when we demonize people, when we believe that a person or a set of policies are the answer, when we think the battle is ours to win, when we compromise the gospel by using the tactics and strategies of the enemy, when our politics takes precedence over the gospel, when we care more about what we think than what impression we are giving people about Jesus, we've become more like the culture and less like the church. We might be warriors, but we've lost the divine part. So let me ask you three questions. Number one, who do you find challenging to love? Number two, are you more likely to be characterized by anger or by compassion? Number three, what is one way that following Jesus has taught you to live counterculturally? Hi, thanks for watching. The people of Harbor Covenant Church really want you to know the love that God has for you, want to grow with you in faith, and want to serve alongside you, not only to help others do the same, but also to make our families and our communities better. If that sounds like something that you can get on board with, then like, follow, and drop us a comment in the video. Watch some more videos on our channel or come visit us on Sunday. You can find out more about Harbor Covenant Church at harborcove.church.